thing in the Akbar program. But then I leave the word to you, uh, Sheila. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. And um, what an audacious position to be in to kick this conversation off. But um, um, I would like to invite all of you to interrupt me, to comment as, as I talk. Um, or if you choose to wait until after, that's fine. But I love to be interrupted because it allows us to be more connected with one another. So we've been asked to address the central challenges that we confront as professionals and how knowing or our being able to articulate those challenges might help us you know, to create more effective uh, forms of practice, more ways of being connected with people, and connected with the world, uh, as Tor Dog and colleagues call it, reality. So um, our current practice is, it often starts from a very creative and often a very radical place. You know, different models and theories and new forms of practice, they're really exciting. And um, so when systemic ideas in the therapy field were new, that was extremely exciting. Uh, collaborative dialogic, open dialogue ideas, that was really exciting. But what often happens is very quickly they become codified, they become formalized, they become routine and so forth. And all of a sudden we are delivering our help in this very particular way to our clients, to the population. The, the form of our health is also simultaneously being packaged and sold, right? So training programs, you know, come to, come to the open dialogue training pro not that I have anything, I think they're great, so for those of you who are involved, but, um, but you know, we have branding. I mean, it's, it's sort of like um, popular culture has taken over, you know, that everybody needs a brand and needs to do something. Um, w the effect for on us as professionals, I think, is that we don't have to think. We are not required to put ourselves into the relationship. We might try to, but you know, if we're following the formula. So let me just make another point here that we know this is the case with evidence-based practice, you know, that you just are supposed to do what you're supposed to do. My argument here is also that we should really consider that those forms of practice that may not fall under the purview of evidence-based practice, like open dialogue and different kinds of uh, systemic practice, those also can become routinized and formulaic and so forth. And so we aren't, it, it's, and we're so uh, filled with, with so many cases and so much work and so much paperwork that, that we don't have time or energy to put ourselves into the relations. Okay, so we just follow the formula. So with that, the, the challenges, as I see it, to answer the question that's been asked are numerous. Um, the, the first that I would note is the neoliberal individualist discourse that focuses our attention on isolated beings. Um, there's a lot, there's been a lot written about the effect and fallout from late capitalism that we become more and more and more isolated. So as wealth grows, homes grow, uh, bedrooms grow, everyone has their own bedroom, everyone has their own TV in their own bedroom, no one, even in families, people don't need to connect with one another as much. Um, if I have a problem, uh, I should go see a therapist but my husband and my family members should kind of stay away and let the, the therapist do the work because my closest contacts might interrupt the therapeutic process. So there's all this fracturing and all this isolation that, that comes in, in this error. And so that's one of the challenges that we confront. How do we, how do we break that up? How do we connect and and infuse in our practice not just the delivery of something or you know some kind of uh, uh, cure for people or an education learning how do we 
how do we really connect with people? That's, so that's one of the challenges confronted. Another is, as I said, the codification of what were perhaps novel ideas, theories, or practices into schools, techniques, and movements. Okay, so that's, that's a challenge, but I address that. Um, also, that for what I mentioned, the formulaic no aspect of professional practice, um, it reminds me of uh, what John Schotter used to always draw a distinction between planning and preparing. So when you plan, and we've all done this, I'm sure, let's say you have to give a, a public speech and you plan exactly what you're going to say and then you, you know, enter into the space and regardless of who the people are or what's happening, you just deliver your message as you planned. But there's no connection because you're not feeling where people are and what people are doing and so forth. So that's a plan. Being prepared, you might have your plan and then you walk into the space and you say, oh, this is where I'm going to start, or this is what I'm going to do. So there's, a, there's this improvisation that comes with preparing that really puts us in connection with one another. When I was a brand new assistant professor, I used to write out you know, on a yellow tablet, like all, word for word, what I wanted to say in my lecture. And then five minutes before the seminar would begin, I would say, oh my god, I don't know what I'm going to say. And, you know, it was all there. And then, but I knew that the minute I would cross the threshold into the room, I, I would know what I had to say. So this notion of moving away from the formulaic, from the plan, and into the being prepared, you know, how can you prepare so that you can improvise, so that you can be with the other. Um, that's one of the, uh, another one of the challenges. Um, another is a lack of awareness of the inseparability between, and these may be nasty words for some people, between the macro and the micro. Okay, our micro processes and the macro discourses. So let me, I'm going to use this now to our dog. So I'll move it. I got it. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's, there's something else embedded in this, which is um, an articulation of, you know, I, I'm the social constructionist here, but an articulation of what that means. There are so many misconceptions <coughs> about social construction, and the ones that have been raised are ones that I absolutely agree with. So this, this challenge of the micro-macro is central to understanding how I understand social construction, and also it's, it's a, a major challenge that we confront. So I have a very, I call it a quick and dirty way of understanding how I understand social construction. And it looks like this. So people come together in coordination, OK? Um, so this room. We all came together, everybody, you know, took a seat. No one sat on anyone's lap or knocked anyone on the ground or anything like that. It, it's, you know, we, it nego we coordinate not just with each other but with our environment as well. And that's a piece of, you know, bringing the real world into how important that, that piece is the real world in what we do together and what gets created as our understanding of that world. So we coordinate. Well, people walking down a busy city street uh, at rush hour, throngs of people, let's say in Manhattan or any, pick any large city, they, they negotiate and coordinate and make their way. You might brush against somebody a little bit, but you know, you don't, no, no blood is, is spared. So, so coordination, and I, I, I'm sort of toying these days, and again, we're struggling, we're all struggling with these ideas, so I don't really know, but um, I think coordination is kind of something that is natural to us, if, I, if you can say that in a, in a context where you're talking about constructed realities. I think, as human beings, we coordinate, and pe different people coordinate in different ways. So it's not 
one way of coordinating. The other thing to mention is there's no value attached in my understanding of coordination. Arguments are well coordinated, war is well coordinated, so uh, it's not the good, it's just that we coordinate. And one of the things that happens when we coordinate is that very quickly we develop a pattern, a pattern of interaction. So um, with my students, I always you know, say, oh, look how you've coordinated and you're sitting around the seminar table. The second time we meet, they're all in the same places. The third time we meet, they're all in the same places. So you know, there's a pattern, this is where I belong. Okay? Now there are always a couple people for whom the pattern is to always sit someplace else, but that's still a pattern. So it, it really doesn't take long for people to create a pattern from their form of coordination. And once we have a pattern, we have expectations. So this is the way I do it. If um, after lunch you come and sit in the same place, and then tomorrow morning you come and someone else is in that place, you sort of think, that's my place, what are you doing there? So, so it, it, you know, it, this happens so quickly, all right? And this is actually the, the creation of meaning making. You know, this is the creation of a worldview or a way of seeing the world. Once we have these kind of, the, the coordinations leading to the patterns generating expectations, we have what we could call a whole world view that's been established or there are multiple terms. Sometimes I call it a social order. Sometimes I call it a moral order. Sometimes I just call it beliefs and values. But it's a whole way of looking at the world where you say, in this group, this is how it's done. Okay? And our worldviews, our beliefs and values, feed back into how we coordinate with others. All right. This is not a mental process. This is uh, an interactive, unfolding process. And next time we come together and coordinate, we may spin off and create a whole nother belief system or worldview or moral order, whatever you want to call it. So the challenge of not recognizing Back to the beginning point, the challenge of not recognizing the connection between the micro and the, and the mi macro is this. Here we have the micro, and here we have the macro. And I think when we start talking about, I don't know if you're familiar, but you know, people write about light and dark social construction or soft and hard social construction. And of course, the dark and the hard is the macro, and the light and the soft is the micro, okay? So that's like what people do together, right? So that's light, you know, it's just us, right? But the macro is like Foucauldian, you know, perspective of looking at dominant discourses, looking at institutions and how they guide us, how they seem <coughs> to force us Okay, that macro level is filled with shoulds and oughts and musts. This is the way we do it. But what this shows, I, for me, that's so important, is that this would never exist if we didn't engage in this way. Okay, so our fingerprints are all over the very dominant discourses or institutional ways of being that we dislike as much as they are with the ones that we like. So change can happen at any level, but it certainly could happen here. If we coordinate with each other in different ways, we create different patterns, we create different expectations, we create different worldviews, we create a different world to live in, right? Now, important here, uh, particularly pertinent to this topic that we're all here for today, is I'm not just talking about people coordinating with people here. I'm talking, again, it's important to realize we're talking about the constraints of the physical world, what's possible, what's not possible. 
Um, some of you may be familiar with Michael Pollan's work from, oh, it must be 20 years ago, The Botany of Desire, where he talks about how plants choose us, we don't choose them, okay? Um, and, and all these uh, inhuman, uh, things that aren't human really are very much part of and, and influencing who we can become as people. So the real world matters, and I think for a lot of people who write as constructionists, they don't include that piece, how much what's happening in the real world impinges upon us, limits, constrains, and potentiates who we can become and who we are just as much as our interactions with one another. So another just comment on, the, two more comments on this. This is not a closed circuit, you know, any of these we could spin off and create something new. But what's important to realize, if you think of us just a circle as being emblematic of this process, this is how we live our lives, you know. We're involved in multiple moral and social orders, multiple belief systems, multiple worldviews. Nobody inhabits just one, okay. So that's one thing to hold on to. And another is that we can start understanding difference and diversity using these ideas by saying, here's a community of people who believe in gun control, let's say. And here's a group of people who do not believe in gun control and both are totally coherent and consistent within their community. The rationale, the logic, the way of living a life makes perfect sense. It's moral, it's ethical, it's right, okay? But from the other vantage point, when, I, when this group looks at this group, these are the evil bad people. When this group looks at this group, the, these are the evil bad people, okay? So then we're confronted with, you know, what can we do about that? And a lot of my work, you know, has to do with how do you deal with difference and how do you, you know, intractable difference? So how do you create the conditions to have conversations, to have some kind of dialogue where these people can create together an alternative? And that doesn't mean agreeing. That simply means creating possibilities and creating new forms of understanding. And we can flesh that out over the, the next couple of days um, because I don't want to dwell completely on that. But I do feel that one of the challenges, a huge challenge that we face as professionals, as practitioners, is not recognizing this con connection. That again, as I said earlier, our fingerprints are all over the very institutional discourses, disciplinary discourses that we maybe don't like. So it's kind of a fast forward to when we get talking about what to do about this. It's very hard in institutions that we work in to not do as we're told. You have the fear of losing your job, of not being promoted or whatever. So I think the challenge is how do you, how do you meet the requirements by somehow twisting what, the way in which you reach those requirements? So how do, you, how do you encounter the other in a way that really puts you into the situation with that person and makes it look like you're doing, you know, check, checking the box of how you, you've delivered your treatment or taught your class or whatever the issue is. So uh, we, we can unfold that, I hope, as we move along because there's a lot to be said about that. And the last challenge that, um, that I would just point to is the construction in all of this of what counts as normal, okay? So the dominant discourses, these macro level worldviews, 
and, and I'll use that term a lot, dominant discourses. Um, and we know they're dominant because we take them for granted. Okay, you know you're operating within a like solidified, reified worldview when I ask you why did you do that or why did you say that and you say because that's the way it's done. Then, then you know <laughs> you're, you're operating from a dominant discourse. A, and, and so those taken for granted ways of operating generate a sense of normalcy, what should be done, and in so doing, they generate a sense of pathology, okay, those who do not fall in to what should be done. So I think those are the challenges that we confront. And I think that those challenges generate several topics that we should take up. And one is um, the hindrance of any deep engagement with and in and within the world. So they really, these challenges keep us from being with each other, being with and in our environment, and thinking about it acting on it, you know, speaking about it. We just take it for granted instead and kind of work on autopilot, as it were. Um, also generated from these challenges is a dislocation from ethics. Ethics become, to most professionals, abstract. They're the, the codified rules that you, uh, in your profession, must follow. So, for example, in therapy, there's often, you know, a, a code of, there is always a code of ethics, and often a primary one is um, not having uh, multiple relationships with clients. In other words, you simply have the professional client relationship. But imagine this. Imagine you've been seeing as a, a clinician uh, a teenage girl, let's say, who has a lot of anxiety and uh, feels insecure. And over the time of working with this person, um, she's come to, you know, into fruition. She's feeling secure, she's not as anxious, She's about to, she's going to graduate, she's going to go off to university, and she invites you to her graduation from high school. And you say, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> can't come. Because that's a different kind of relationship. And, you know, you can imagine multiple next moves on that in that case. But one very likely could be, you know, a spiraling down of the, the client, you know, it back into insecurity. Oh, I thought we had a good relationship. Oh, did I make a mistake? Oh, what's happened? And so forth. And so the, the abstract code of ethics, of course, you know, you want to, you know, monitor the kinds of relationships you have with, with your clients, but at that strict level. So, we need, my response to ethics is to say we need a, an ethic of discursive potential, which simply means we need an ethic that allows ourselves and the people we work with to expand the discursive resources that they have available to them. That's, you know, that's what we want to do. We want people to see possibilities where they've only seen constraints. And so different ways of being in the world might open that up. Okay, another uh, thing generated by the challenges is a lack of reflexivity, okay? And I think critical to the work that we do is recognizing the centrality of reflexivity. Most, you know, uh, this may be unfair to say, but I don't think it is. Uh, modernist theory and practice is unreflexive. You do something, why you do it? Because that's how the way you're supposed to do it. You don't question. And I think a, a 
hallmark of the kind of practice that we're talking about is continually engaging in that inner dialogue. Is there another way I could do this? Am I so certain this is a good thing to do? I wonder what you know, some, somebody else would do about this. All that inner dialogue. So to ironically put aside the certainty about our own professional practice. And I say that's ironic because the hallmark of a good professional is being competent and certain. I mean, you're not competent if you're not certain. And so, and we train people. We train people to be professionals to know what they should do. So this it goes completely against the grain to entertain uncertainty as a professional. And oftentimes, you know, we, if you tr have tried it in your own practice, you say, well, I, I'm not sure. What do you think? Or I don't know. You could do this or you could do that. The people you're working with or speaking with might say, no, but you need to tell me. My students used to do the, this with me. You know, I would have this, you know, we'd have a seminar and I would just be in conversation with them and they'd say, could you please just give a lecture? <laughs> you know? and so, you know, and I would say, well, but a lecture means like I, you think I have everything that I can, that needs to be said and I, I want to talk with you. And so that embracing uncertainty is hard for us as professionals, but I think it's precisely what we need to do to, to doubt and to doubt our own notion of what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. So that's, that's raised, that issue is raised by the challenges. Um, another issue raised by the challenges is, uh, I borrow from John Schotter here, aboutness thinking as opposed to withness thinking, which, you know, I love when he talks about these ideas. So aboutness thinking is, you know, I'm looking at you as the expert and I'm talking about you and I'm understanding about you and I know what needs to be done to you, etc. Instead of withness thinking, we, I may be an expert in, fill in the blank, but you are an expert in your life. And so together, let's bring our expertise together and try to fig, you know, work, work at what needs to happen here. Okay, so the, we need to uh, be aware of our tendency of aboutness thinking. Um, also generated is the isolation created by the neoliberal ideology. So again, I raised that already. At, so I, I think we have to constantly be aware of how isolated people are. I mean, think of, um, you know, if someone is uh, dealing with a substance misuse, they get isolated, you know, sent off to rehab when maybe what they really need is to be embraced by family, friends. Okay, so our, 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 our answer to problems is almost always to isolate. You know, you go, to, you go to your therapy, you go to your treatment, you go to your remedial classes because you're not doing well in school, et cetera, et cetera. So um, also is the knowing that versus knowing how. The challenges point out that we are engaged in a world that we know that, X, Y, and Z, and we have forgotten to know how, how to engage with others, how to generate multiple understandings of a situation instead of having one understanding. And I think there's also a focus on getting it right rather than finding a way, finding our way, wayfaring as, as people talk about. And I think getting it right as opposed to wayfaring means that we give up creativity. We give up bumbling through and landing on something innovative, <coughs> something that surprises us ourselves. So 
how do we get rid of this attempt to always get it right? And finally, I think the challenges generate a view of experts, well, a view of professionals as experts, and that we are all knowing having impl implications for what we do in order to appear competent, as I mentioned before. So, you know, we are positioned in this kind of neoliberal ideology, this individualist world as the all-knowing expert. And there are all sorts of uh, challenges and problems that come with that, which include things like the fear of failing. What if we could all fail frequently? And in that failing, new innovations and new forms of practice would be born, could be born, could arise. So um, the second part of the question posed to us was, how can knowing or articulating what these challenges are help us um, in being of help to the people that we are trying to help? And so I think first, knowing and articulating the challenges, knowing and articulating what these challenges generate helps us to acknowledge the diversity of beliefs, values, understandings that, that we live amongst, okay? That we're, we're, we're in this kind of world. I mean, this, you know, where there are just multiple perspectives. So another comment on, you know, there's an understanding of social construction, for example, as rampant relativism, anything goes. But that's not at all my view of social construction. It, and it's not that there is no reality. It's that there are multiple realities, OK? And, there, and one of those multiple, or many of those multiple realities, entail the physicality of the world in which we live, the materiality of the world. So um, once we kind of step into the, the space, we see that there's so many ways of understanding and being in the world. And how can we position ourselves as we work with others to be open to and curious about the way those others are understanding the world and seeing the world, okay? Instead of, and you all know this, but you know, the impulse to evaluate, to judge, to end, or to discern which is right and which is wrong. Okay, can we give all of that up and instead just accept the multiplicity? And you know, when we confront differentiation or diversity, like in this, as this demonstrates, you know, what do we do with it? If we try to evaluate it, if we try to assess, if we try to figure out who's right and who's wrong, then there's, there's no possibility to create something together. There's no possibility to encounter the other in that visceral way. But if we, instead of evaluating or judging or saying who's right and who's wrong, if we enter with curiosity, I'd like to understand how you understand the world or how you understand this issue. Then we begin a dialogue. Then we begin a conversation. Okay. If I'm curious about you, genuinely curious, then the likelihood that you're curious about me is much greater. If I listen to you, if I listen generously, then the possibility that you listen to me and listen generously is much greater. So our propensity to judge, evaluate, determine right and wrong really gets in the way. I think also understanding these challenges can ignite curiosity about those diverse beliefs, values, and understandings. And uh, as I just said, rather than attempt to kind of unify and erase difference. The, the modernist project really 
it, it's amazing what a stronghold it has on us because we live in an incredibly complex world. If we go back centuries, we could say, well, yeah, it made a lot of sense to think that we lived in a kind of uh, world where everyone shared the same point of view because we didn't have access to other points of view. I mean, we didn't have all the technology that we have today. We had um, geographical barriers that we had no way of getting beyond if we go way back. So, you know, it's easy to say this is what a good person in this community looks like. But now uh, we live where we see so much diversity physically in our presence, but also just, you know, globally around it, it, at the touch of a finger, we see difference. And so we can no longer, I don't know why we attempt to find what the solution to a problem is as if there could be one solution. And I think that's a, a challenge for us he, during our time together here. The challenges that you described, Toradag, you know, our challenges, but I don't think we want to come with one solution. I think what we want is to uh, perhaps think about what small ways can each of us go back into our personal and professional relationships and disrupt them a little bit. Not disrupt them enough to get you in trouble <laughs> or lose your job, but disrupt them creatively. To, in ways that invite others to follow you in that disruption. To say, oh, there's, there's a different way that we could do this. So I mean, to me, that's, that's a challenge that I throw out because each one of you would do that differently instead of us here as a collective saying, okay, now we, we have our marching orders. This is the way we're going to confront reality <laughs> and, uh, and make these changes. Um, I think also knowing these challenges uh, positions us as, and again, I'm going to draw on John Schotter. I love this. He used to talk about being poised, okay? And his notion was, you know, many times we're ready. We know what we need to do, and, and we're going to do it. But when he used the term poised, he, he said, think about a tennis player and how a tennis player, you know, waiting for the ball is like ready to go in any direction because he or she has to be ready to go in any direction. So how do we position ourselves that way as being poised rather than, again, one of the key challenges we face, this formulaic, okay, this is how I, I practice, and this is, this is, whether it's, you know, in the mental health field or in education or in healthcare, you know, this is the way I teach, this is the way I do this. How do we uh, create this position of being poised? Um, Hmm. Um, and finally, I think that these key challenges um, do not allow us to ignore our discomfort. So it can be uncomfortable engaging with others, with the other. And we have really a, a whole armament of ways to protect ourselves from feeling uncomfortable, mostly hiding behind the guise of our professional identity. You know, well, I'm the professional, I'm the expert, I know. So whatever is happening here that doesn't feel right, not my fault, okay? And the, so the question is, you know, how do we embrace the discomfort and use that to encounter the other more fully, to bring ourselves into that moment? Uh, to be positioned as what I write about and like to talk about as being radically present. And I use the term radical presence to just get out of 
the talk about the mind, about mental aspects. You feel that, how do we feel that visceral connection with others rather than go into that rote, this is what I do, um, or recede to the mind? I really, in this regard, there are two people whose work I really like. Ed Sampson, he talks about, he has a book called Celebrating the Other. It's an old book, 1993, I think. And it's a beautiful book because he talks about the difference between monologism and dialogism. And in dialogism, we really uh, celebrate the other. Uh, you know, I can't exist. I can't be who I am if you are not with me the way you're with me. So the other really matters. And he, de he defines monologism as the other simply being a serviceable other. So in a therapeutic context, the client just allows the therapist to be the great therapist, right? You just service me and, and bolster up my identity, okay? In the classroom, the professor becomes the professor and the student is just, you know, a, just there. I mean, that, that identifies who I am. But when you're in a dialogic space, you need each other, you celebrate the other, recognizing that the, how the other responds to you, how the other acts, is, is part of creating what's even possible for you. My actions, my words have no meaning until the other responds. I may have ideas about what I mean and what I'm saying, but once the other responds, it may be completely different because others respond in different ways. The other, besides Samson, is Gregory Bateson, who is a cornerstone for me and always has been. So to the extent that we had quotes from Gregory Bateson in our wedding vows, and um, my brother, who was an attorney, married us, and he's reading this, and he <laughs> looked up and he said, I have to say, I've never seen wedding vows that are footnoted. <laughs> so, talk about two academics marrying each other, right? Um, but, you know, Bateson, he talks about the pattern that connects, and then he talks about mind as social. And so I can start, I can talk about mental process if it's talking about mind as social. And I just want to read this quote because it, it's beautiful the way he says it. Um, he says, mind is social, not bound by the skull, but rather as imminent also in pathways and messages outside the body, and still imminent in the total interconnected social system and planetary ecology. So, you know, this return to reality, Bateson was there back in, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s already recognizing the pattern that connects us all, you know, and connects the world. So I think that those, for me, those two, you know, Samson and Bateson really um, offer something into this notion of being radically present. Because it, it, it's just an abstract notion, radical present, what, what, what does it mean? But it, it really means to, to step out of that expert position and bring the curiosity, bring the non-judgment temporarily. I mean, we all, <laughs> we all judge and we have to, and we have to assess. But, you know, in the end of the day, decisions must be made, right? But how we make those decisions and how we get to that matters. And if we get to those decisions simply by following a formula, following what we should do as competent professionals, then again, we're not bringing ourselves into the encounter. But if we bring ourselves into the encounter, we make decisions, but they're very different. 
They're very embodied, they're embodied with the other. So I could go, I don't know how long I've been talking. Long enough? No, <laughs> long enough, that's why I'm standing up. Like, that's what I thought. We have two whole days, so it's a paradox. That yeah, yeah. We have to no, that's good. That's good. That's a good place to stop. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. So, so. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.